Okay, folks, defense closing arguments in the Angela Kilgore case from Tennessee. We're going to break those down a little bit. Eric Weitz is a trial attorney in Philadelphia. He's joining us here on the Law and Crime Network. Eric, good to see you here on Law and Crime. Thanks for having me back, Aaron. Okay, so what do you make of this closing argument here? It sounds to me like I can sum it up by saying nobody investigated that. It doesn't make sense, and I don't get that. Is this guy yes, making uh, any relevant points here? I think if the jury is permitted to vote, they're going to vote to send the lawyer to jail. It, it, <laughs> it, 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 it's um, it, He's all over the place. I, I, look, I get the point. He, he's trying to establish reasonable doubt by poking holes. But generally, unless there is a theme or a story that, that a defense attorney can tell, uh, she's probably uh, not going to be making any plans for Thanksgiving. Well, look, I mean, this is a strong case. I mean, you, you've got this defendant botching a previous uh, bank robbery attempt, of course, which, which I don't think really came into this case. But you've got the victim's DNA, blood, all over this defendant's shoes. You've got a witness at the scene seeing this defendant with purple surgical gloves, and she claimed it was just to protect herself from some kind of poison uh, sumac or poison oak or something like that. It didn't make any sense to the person who saw it, but look, we're going to be back with more closing arguments in the Angela Kilgore case from Tennessee after this quick break here on Law and Crime. We are listening to closing arguments, ladies and gentlemen, in the Angela Kilgore case. The state methodically taking down some of the confusion that the defense threw in front of jurors. We're going to switch over, though, and talk about the Oliver case that's happening in Texas. This is the case of a police officer convicted of murder. We are expecting to have some uh, additional relatives of the police officer on the stand, including possibly the police officer's ex-wife. Eric Weitz is still with me here. We are uh, expecting some uh, some pretty critical testimony here. Family members, uh, possibly a sister of the defendant, getting on the stand in a sentencing hearing. Mentioning his mother took the stand, his uh, current wife took the stand, his common law wife. It's been absolutely heart wrenching. Uh, you know, to the extent that. I guess they had a tough set of facts for the underlying case. They've put on a pretty amazing case trying to pull at every heartstring possible uh, for the sentencing phase. Yeah, we're going to take a uh, quick break here on the Law and Crime Network. Attorney White, so certainly stick around with us. And we're going to bring you back to that high-profile case in Texas where that police officer, Roy Oliver, is trying to argue for a different fate. We'll be right back. Okay, folks, we're waiting for jurors to come back into that Texas courtroom where a police officer was just yesterday, about 24 hours ago, convicted of murdering a 15-year-old African-American who was not armed, who was a passenger in a vehicle that was in the process of leaving a scene where officers were called to investigate a report of underage drinking. That report led to shots fired. It led to the death of the victim in this case, Jordan Edwards. We are still on the line with Eric White, a trial attorney from Philadelphia. Bottom line, the defense does not want this defendant's sister to testify at this hearing. Apparently, we're hearing from the courtroom that the defendant himself was shocked when the state tried to call his sister as a rebuttal witness. Yeah, she uh, apparently came forward at noon and drove from out of town to uh, come in and testify. Uh, it's so, something's up or or just maybe the defense is worried that the volume of witnesses I, I don't know yeah I mean I, I'm really curious to see exactly where this case is going to head at this point uh, look we are uh, just as curious as everyone else to see what's going on with this we also have a uh, a witness here who we just heard in court has her own criminal past and can that be used to color her testimony uh, that she may be giving in this case uh, with a negative brush and say, maybe you're just up here lying about your brother trying to save your own hide in some proceeding that you've had. Yeah, I guess it depends on exactly what her prior criminal past is. I know the judge just ordered to, uh, the district attorney or the prosecutor to go out and run uh, NCIC report to see what's out there on her. You know, if it was if, if she has a drunk driving, that's one thing. If she has some sort of check forgery or some sort of crime of fraud, that's a whole different story. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we are really waiting to see exactly how long this is going to roll out. We're waiting for jurors to come back into this courtroom. Jurors are heading back into the room, and uh, we're waiting to see exactly where this testimony goes with the sister of defendant Roy Oliver, the police officer who just yesterday was convicted of murder in the death of a 15-year-old. We are waiting again, as I said, for jurors to come into this courtroom. What is the sister going to say against the defendant who uh, was just yesterday convicted, and how is it that she's winding up on the state's side of the case? She's taking the oath. Let's listen. Testimony there from the sister of convicted killer Roy Oliver, an officer who fired shots at a car that was fleeing a scene where officers were called to investigate reports of underage drinking. The victim in this case was a 15-year-old who was unarmed. Attorney Eric Weitz is still on the line with us here at the Law and Crime Network. Uh, Attorney Weitz, what did you take away from that testimony from the sister? Sometimes you're in the middle of trial and you make these last minute decisions on a hunch or whatever. Sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. Obviously, she called up with a head full of steam, told the prosecutor she'd like to come in and tell the jury what she thinks about her brother. And she really didn't have much to say other than the fact that they clearly don't have a very close relationship. There's that. And she said, well, you know, I, th I think that there should be justice in this case, that kind of thing. But look, I mean, she wasn't there listening to all the testimony from what we know. Didn't she say that she was just picking it up from news reports? Yeah. And, and, and you know, she the, I thought the defense did a good job. I mean, she doesn't even know his family and what's going on with him or anything else about what the jury just heard. Uh, she clearly has an axe to grind. And I think it came out without them having to overplay it. Yeah, I think that the defense cross was uh, was pretty skillful there in sort of deflating that testimony without directly saying you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, that's the way it came across to me. We um, were continuing to monitor the situation, though, in that courtroom in Texas, in the Roy Oliver case, another witness on the stand. And, and look, this testimony from the, the sister was uh, markedly similar to some of the testimony we saw yesterday. Uh, a lot of the testimony, especially in this sentencing phase, is is opinion based. Well, this is what I thought of the victim. This is what I think of the defendant. And we're getting a lot of opinions thrown out there in this particular stage. Again, we're going to continue to monitor the situation. We will be right back in just a moment here on Law and Crime. There was testimony in the state's rebuttal in the sentencing phase of the Roy Oliver case from Dallas, Texas. Testimony there from the family pastor of the victim's family. Eric Weitz is an attorney in Philadelphia. He's following this case with us here on Law and Crime. Attorney Weitz, the pastor on the stand, we heard religious themes yesterday during the sentencing hearing as well. Discussions from teachers about the victim's religious views. Now we have the pastor on the stand talking about the funeral, whether or not there are religious messages tied into the funeral that the sentencing can tie into. What do you make of this? Wow. Uh, you know, to have a pastor take the stand and suggest that, our, that a person be punished more than what's being discussed uh, is not something you see every day. And I understand the pastor's relationship with the victim and the victim's family, but usually you see pastors on the stand talking about uh, redemption and other items like that. He was using the Bible to say, throw the book at him. Yeah, I mean, this is a little bit remarkable testimony because we usually don't see it come into this degree. And we've seen the defense lodge objection after objection after objection in this case as to the sort of evidence that's coming into this particular hearing. The defense tried to say that the character of the victim shouldn't come into the proceeding unless the defendant and the victim had a prior relationship. That objection was uh, overruled by the judge, said, no, forget it, this is all coming in. Do you agree, disagree, or uh, is, just this, is this just so different from what we usually see that, that it's sort of hard to process it on the fly? Yeah, part of what's so awful about this crime is that, that the officer, Oliver, was just shooting into a car that was fleeing the scene. Uh, it, so whatever the character of the victim was is irrelevant. Uh, the, the, the bullet happened to tragically hit this child as opposed to the other people in the car. Uh, it, it, now in the sentencing phase, 
uh, it's it's amazing. You know, the defense, again, keeps objecting to some of these witnesses, but the prosecution, you know, to allow a pastor come on and give a religious opinion about what the Bible says should be a penalty is something that generally ought not be considered uh, under you know, our legal system, and I'm certain under that state's laws. And I, I'm starting to have a lot of concern that we're going to see this, uh, the, potentially parts of this case come back for retrial. You know, I was wondering the same thing yesterday. And, and look, I'm, I'm certainly not being dismissive of the message, but I, I'm wondering about the place for the message. Certainly, this is the sort of message that is welcome uh, and, and that the community encourages in, in churches and, and places of religious worship. To have it come into a sentencing hearing uh, creates a, another possible issue because the last thing that that community wants is probably for this case to come back for another trial or another hearing. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor that situation. Just to let you folks know, in the Roy Oliver case, the state did rest its rebuttal case in this sentencing phase of the trial of that Dallas, Texas area police officer who was just yesterday convicted of murdering a 15 year old who was taking off from a scene as a passenger in a vehicle. We're going to continue to follow that situation because it's probably going to be in the hands of the jurors any moment. We also want to update you folks on a case that we covered earlier, about a month ago, here on the Law and Crime Network. That is the Jordan Lamond case out of New Hampshire. This is a Seacoast, New Hampshire case that involved basically a parking lot beating of a Planet Fitness employee in the Rochester, New Hampshire area. That's the video. That's the defendant throwing punches at that female Planet Fitness employee. He drops her here any second. There it is, upper center of your screen. This resulted in a trial. The question was not the defendant's conduct, but whether it was prohibited by the letter of the law. Prosecutors saw a higher charge. The defense said, no, 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 this should only be a lesser charge. We're talking about this right now because a sentencing hearing has been going on in New Hampshire as we speak in that case, just to let you folks know what's going on. The state was requesting two to five years in prison for the defendant. The defendant said, no, 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 that shouldn't even be the sentence. This, the defense wanted a 12-month sentence with all but 60 days of that sentence suspended. So in other words, the defense was just saying two months in jail for that highly publicized attack caught on camera outside Planet Fitness. The defendant said that his victim didn't deserve it. He started to break down while he was giving his own statement, said, I feel bad for her. The final sentence from the judge in New Hampshire, two to five years in prison, siding with the state's request for that attack. The reason for the attack, if you remember back from the original case, was apparently the defendant felt he was trying to get retribution from that victim's boyfriend. He accused that victim's boyfriend of stealing some kind of money from a safe. Did that really happen? Nobody really knows because there was no police report. It was just sort of a accusation that was levied without any proof that this was the rationale. Well, I'll just attack the girlfriend to try to get retribution on the boyfriend. But the bottom line, jurors saw through that. Jurors ultimately issued a decision on a higher charge, a verdict on a higher charge for Jordan Lamond. The sentence in this case handed down just moments ago in that New Hampshire courtroom, two to five years in prison. That is what, uh, that is what the state requested in the Jordan Lamont case. We are continuing to monitor that situation because there are a couple of other moving parts in it. Uh, apparently, the uh, defendant himself also, uh, at one point in this case, uh, cut off uh, his GPS monitor. That was uh, just this week. He's uh, alleged to have cut off his GPS monitor and then uh, turned himself in for doing so four hours later. So uh, a, a lot of moving parts in the Jordan Lamont case, uh, as there has been from the beginning. But look, one thing the defense did say in sentencing is that the nefarious character, to use a quote from the defense, of the defendant himself will live on forever because of that viral video. Parts of that recording were released by the police department in Rochester, New Hampshire, in an attempt to identify the attacker because nobody knew who he was. The victim didn't know who he was. 
Ultimately, community tips led to the defendant, Jordan Lamont. We're going to be right back after a quick break here on the Law and Crime Network. We are monitoring the situation in the Roy Oliver case in Texas. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Law and Crime. We are following three big trials across the United States. I want to get you up to speed on what just came into us here at Law and Crime. That is that the jury has reached a decision in the sentencing phase of the Shana Huber's case out of northern Kentucky. This is a case just across the river from Cincinnati, Ohio, where a young woman was convicted late yesterday of murder for the death of her attorney boyfriend named Ryan Poston. We were closely monitoring the Shana Huber's case here at Law and Crime. I was down there myself for a week covering opening statements and the first week of this case. Interesting case. The defendant said that this was basically extreme psychological pressure, which led her to pull the trigger. She said that the victim was both physically and emotionally abusive towards her. But his acquaintances, his colleagues, and his friends said, no, 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 it was the other way around. Shayna Hubers just didn't get the message that Ryan Poston wanted her gone from a relationship, and because he was such a nice guy, he basically kept her tagging along until finally saying, okay, we are through, and by the way, I've got a date with Miss Ohio 2012. That is when authorities say Shayna Hubers pulled the trigger. They say it was flat-out murder. Jurors agreed in the Shana Hubers case. This case then moved into a penalty phase where Shana Hubers would learn her punishment. Jurors were considering a possible sentencing range of 20 to 50 years or a possibility of life in prison. The first time around, Shana Hubers was sentenced to 40 years. So it's possible, based on what the judge is telling the jurors, that she could get a harsher sentence in this retrial. As you recall, we've been talking about this being a retrial. Shana Hubers was convicted the first time around. That conviction was flipped when it was discovered that a juror in the original case had a felony record. Felons are ineligible for jury service in Kentucky and in most other states, if not all other states. And that is why the original verdict was flipped. Bottom line, another guilty verdict. We are waiting to see exactly what the juror's decision is in the Shana Hubers case. Live streaming, of course, is not allowed in this case. Cameras are present. We are still there. We still have a crew on the scene. We will update you with the sentence as soon as we receive it here at Law and Crime. That's one of the three cases we're following right now. Let's talk about the other ones. The Roy Oliver case in Texas, the state rested its rebuttal case just moments ago in the sentencing phase of that case. Presumably the jurors have that case now, the case of a police officer who was just yesterday convicted of murder for shooting and killing a 15-year-old unarmed African-American who was fleeing the scene. Officers were called to investigate for reports of underage drinking. That case is moving, or has moved, I should say, to a penalty phase, and jurors have that case as well. We are also following the Angela Kilgore case out of Tennessee. This is a case of a woman accused of stabbing and shooting the owner of a pawn shop in a robbery attempt. She is facing some very, very tough evidence, the victim's blood on her boots. She was seen near the scene of the crime wearing surgical gloves. She had guns. She had cuts. She had the defendant's blood on a knife in her possession. This is a very, very strong case for the state of Tennessee. We just watched closing arguments wrap up in that case moments ago. So those are the three cases we're following right now. We are waiting to uh, see if we get an update in the Shana Hubris case. In the meantime, let's get you caught up to speed on some of the other top headlines making news across the country. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawandcrime.com and across the country. A teen in Ohio who went missing six days after reportedly witnessing his father's brutal murder at the hands of his mother and her lover was found safe in Dayton. 15-year-old Jacob Caldwell was found with four adults in a home in Sugar Creek Township after authorities received a tip to his whereabouts. Jacob went missing a year ago after witnessing his mother, Tawny Caldwell, and her boyfriend, Sterling Roberts, murder his father, Robert Caldwell, in front of him and his younger siblings. Tawny Caldwell and Sterling Roberts are in jail facing murder charges, and the four adults Jacob was found with could face charges for allegedly hiding him. 
An unidentified man is claiming he had a 10-month-long sexual relationship with accused killer Chris Watts. Watts is accused of killing his wife Shannon and his two daughters, 4-year-old Bella and 3-year-old Celeste. The man claims Watts told him he was trapped in a loveless marriage. In April 2012, Watts released this video offering relationship advice when dealing with why marriages fail. Sometimes people, when their relationship starts to dissolve, repair is not an option and they want to get away and start new. When you want, when you act, when you want to go into repair, you need to analyze what went wrong and consider what ways of solving the problems. Before Watts was arrested, he begged the public for help finding his family. I just want them back. <laughs> I just, I just want them to come back. And if, if they're not safe right now, that's what's, that's what's tearing me apart. Because if they are safe, they're coming back. But if they're not, this, this, this has got to stop. Like somebody has to come forward. Watts now faces five counts of first-degree murder and four other felony charges. Investigators in Texas are searching for a woman wearing broken wrist shackles and a t-shirt caught on surveillance camera ringing a doorbell of a home before running off. Other neighbors in the Sunrise Ranch area of Montgomery reportedly saw the woman ring several doorbells to no avail before fleeing. Other neighbors in the Sunrise Ranch area of Montgomery reportedly saw the woman ring several doorbells to no avail before fleeing. The identity and whereabouts of this woman remain a mystery, and authorities are investigating the possible connection to a missing person. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law & Crime. All right, let's talk about that last case there. Attorney Eric White's on the line with a still from Philadelphia. What do we make of this video? I mean, certainly police want to investigate, but uh, a lot of people are looking at it saying, hey, look, could this be someone who was being held against her will somewhere, who got free and then was going around ringing doorbells trying to get attention? Nobody answered their doors, so she then disappeared. What do we make of this? Yeah, look, there could be a lot of explanations. The fact that she rings the doorbell and then, and then walks away seems to suggest she's not necessarily looking for help. Uh, maybe she was watching from afar. The, the whole thing is just very odd and concerning. Uh, you know, I, I think the bigger question is, was there any other criminal activity in the area or problems reported that evening? Yeah, I mean, certainly it's open to interpretation. Police still looking for tips in that. We need to report some breaking news in the Shana Hubris case out of Northern Kentucky. We are hearing here at the Law and Crime Network that jurors in this case have recommended a life sentence for convicted Northern Kentucky killer Shana Hubris. We've been talking about this case as much as we can here on Law and Crime, abiding by the judge's order not to do any live streaming and to only show small chunks of the testimony in broadcast coverage. This original case, the original case against Shana Hebrews resulted in a 40 year sentence. This time around, life in prison, that is the recommendation, a much harsher sentence for Shana Hubers. Here, it is highly possible that her testimony sunk her in front of this jury. She didn't take the stand the first time around. This time she did. Jurors must have just simply not taken anything she said and possibly decided to punish her for her version of the way that this shooting went down. Eric Weitz, what do you make of this decision? What do you make of this possible recommended sentence? We, we have to remember the reason that the, there was a second trial to begin with was not because there was an evidentiary problem or, or some other sort of problem. It's because of it, it was a very limited problem with the eligibility of a juror. So the defense knew going in that they had a steep mountain to climb, that they had lost the case. It was simply the eligibility of a juror, not some evidentiary mistake. Mm -hmm. So uh, my guess is that they had nothing else to do, give a shot, put her on the stand and see if uh, she can get one or two jurors to buy her story. You know, this is a case that, that uh, was drastically different the second time around than it was the first time around. The first time around, there was a different defense team, okay? The first time around, we didn't hear anything about purported abuse that Shana Hubers herself uh, felt, uh, sexual abuse, that is. She claimed that she had suffered multiple cases, multiple instances of sexual abuse herself. That was new this time around. Her testimony on the stand was new this time around. But look, Kentucky's murder statute is pretty sympathetic 
to people who claim they're suffering from some kind of emotional disturbance, and she tried to make that case this time around. It's a really interesting murder statute. If you get into the language of it, it's different from any other state that I've seen. It seems to me that they were trying to get at that more so than they were trying to get at this possible self-defense claim. As you well know, Aaron, you know, these statutes are drawn up uh, it, it, you know, by by staffers and then through committees and legislators and ultimately signed into law by governors. It, it, that doesn't often translate real well to 12 jurors who have very little training or knowledge regarding the sophistication of the statute, but they certainly get the concept of did somebody intentionally try and kill somebody else or not? You know, and I think that's what was at play. We've got a little bit less than a minute here, but it's a matter of constitutional debate where a second trial is granted. Can the sentence in this case, as a matter of constitutional fairness, be higher than the original jury's sentence? Do you have any opinion on that? Yeah, I think it depends upon why is there a second trial. Was it, again, was it an evidentiary issue or is the first trial null and void because of an in ineligible juror? As if this the first trial never even existed. It wasn't a proper jury, so therefore the sentence just flat out doesn't matter. Well, this will open right. up a potential ground for an appeal uh, on this sentence if the judge does stick to it. Remember, the judge has the final say. Will the judge take the juror's recommendations? We're going to talk more about this case and the others we're following when we return. Attorney Eric Weitz is still on the line with me from Philadelphia here on Law and & Crime. And one piece that we don't see in that footage is the report that the defendant in this case was giving the middle finger to the car as it sped away after the shots were fired. That's another key piece of evidence here that sort of characterizes the defendant's own state of mind in the moment when those shots were fired. It certainly shows the emotion that was surrounding the situation. I think what's most telling is that virtually all police officers are trained that there's a limited time period and circumstance when you use deadly force. And usually when someone is fleeing, unless they're brandishing a gun and shooting at other people or acting in a way that's going to cause imminent harm to somebody else, you, you just don't shoot people in the back, which is essentially what happened here. He, he was upset that they, they, they didn't listen to his order to stay and they were fleeing and he started shooting. And I know he had a story at trial about uh, trying to suggest that he was worried about his colleagues. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that the value of the body camera shows that that, that just wasn't the case. And so, you know, giving them the finger afterwards, I, I think is reflective of his state of mind, but certainly not the biggest problem here. Yeah, there's a lot of moving parts to this case. The video has been slowed down. It's been played in real time. It's possible, ladies and gentlemen, that we have a verdict coming in uh, in the Angela Kilgore case that we've been talking about in Tennessee. We just took you to the closing arguments in that case about 15 minutes, maybe half an hour ago. I'm losing a little bit track of time. I apologize. But this is a really, really strong case. So if there is indeed a verdict this quickly, it would not surprise me in the slightest. Just to run down some of the evidence that the state recapped in the state's closing argument. You've got the victim's DNA on the defendant's boots that she was found with a couple of days later. She had cuts. She had guns. She was seen wearing purple surgical gloves near the scene when the victim, the pawn shop owner, was shot, stabbed, and then his body was set on fire. A nurse saw her with the gloves. The nurse said, why do you have the gloves on? The defendant said, oh, I have poison oak. The nurse thought that made no sense whatsoever because that's not what you would do if you had poison oak. That nurse brought that fact forward. The defendant's knife that was recovered in her possession had the victim's blood on it. How much more evidence do we need? It's possible jurors came back with a really quick verdict in this case. We are monitoring that situation. We are also monitoring closing arguments beginning 
any moment in the penalty phase of the Roy Oliver case. That's the police officer case that we've been talking about. A very wide sentencing range in that case. A big sentence, a possibility of a small sentence. Where will jurors go? Bottom line, the defendant himself submitted a motion saying, I want jurors, not the judge, to decide my punishment. If indeed I am convicted, that was what the defendant wished for. Well, he's got his wish. Jurors are about to hear closing arguments in that case. We're waiting to see exactly which one's going to pick up first. Uh, Attorney White's uh, interesting for the defendant to sort of pick his poison as to who he wants to deliver his, uh, his punishment. He was able to marshal a lot of evidence and individuals to come in and pull at the heartstrings of the jury. Uh, judges who sentence people tend to hear that a lot, and they see that a lot, and they consider it, but it probably doesn't have the same impact as it would on a jury who is not used to hearing and seeing this. And they got to see at least another picture of this man through his common-law wife, through his mother, through through people he served with. And uh, it, 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 it probably was a good bet because likely he's not going to do worse with the jury. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a lot more character evidence than we would normally see in a case that's being put in front of a jury, but we don't un infrequently see this kind of evidence being brought up at a sentencing hearing in front of a judge. We see victim impact statements all the time. So the question I really have is, this judge really had the let it all in and see what happens approach, and uh, it's going to be very interesting because no doubt there's going to be a lot of issues raised on appeal, especially surrounding this topic. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what the appellate courts do with that to see if uh, the if you want a jury, let them sort it out approach is going to work with no control over the evidence. Yeah, I mean, and I was always taught, hey, look, uh, really uh, tight evidence rules. Judges keep a tight rein on evidence. But what's interesting is to see the uh, the the approach uh, changing a bit from state to state. So, look, we're going to listen to some testimony in the Roy Oliver case while we wait for the actual proceedings to pick up in both Kilgore and in Oliver. This is testimony from the defendant's uh, own father on the witness stand, uh, excuse me, the victim's father on the stand in the Roy Oliver case. Okay, we thought things were picking up. Indeed, they were not. This is taking a little bit longer to get going than we would like. Eric White's trial attorney from Philadelphia. Look, this is a case with ridiculously strong evidence in the state's behalf. It would not surprise me that there is a very quick verdict in this case, and it would not be a surprise if it is a guilty verdict. They, the, the prosecution in this case had everything except for a video showing the defendant doing it. They had a high resolution video at that. Yeah, exactly. They, DNA, guns, knives, witnesses. Yeah, yeah they had everything. They, they had the, the they had the the defendant's DNA on the plaintiff, and they had the plaintiff's DNA on the defendant as she was fleeing the scene. Okay, looks like the judge is speaking from the stand, so let's dip into this one more time and hope that we get answers. And as the judge goes through the time-honored task of polling individual jurors to make sure that no one was coerced into this verdict, reaction from attorney Eric Weitz from Philadelphia, I'm not surprised. I don't think you are either. Hey, I, the only thing that surprises me is if, you know, if the jury had had more pages and, and crimes that they could have found her guilty on, they probably would have. Yeah, this was this was an open and shut case. I think she had nowhere to go. They probably weren't offering much in a plea deal, so she rolled the dice. Yeah, and it was a quick trial. It was a very quick verdict. I lost track of the time here, but what was the jury on the clock for maybe 15 minutes? That, that seems to be the shortest verdict time that we see. That's enough time for them to go back into the room look at the paperwork, say, okay, we all think that she's guilty. Then they have to sign it and then deliver it back out. That process takes about 15 minutes. That seems to be what happened here. Yeah, and the, uh, I, I would imagine the prosecutor at this point is probably second guessing whether he had to even say anything in his rebuttal or not, or could have just sat on the evidence. It's possible, but look, it's, it's always helpful to sort of keep hitting home runs in front of the jury. If, you, if you've if you got home runs, then, then keep reminding them of the record. We've got this, we've got that. I thought the rebuttal was powerful. It was pointed. The PowerPoint was helpful. I think that, that it really sealed the case up. It made it so that this deliberation was a very, very brief one. It, well, it, it 
it, certainly the prosecutor can take solace in the fact that the message that the prosecution was trying to convey, the jury got it loud and clear because they didn't have much of a question. Uh, there's no wrangling over the elements of the different crimes. They were able to, to find a complete, you know, guilty on all counts. Okay, we are going to wrap up our coverage of the Angela Kilgore case now and turn our attention back to the Roy Oliver courtroom in, in uh, Texas, rather, skipping so many states, I'm losing track a little bit. I apologize. Back to Texas, though, Roy Oliver, police officer convicted of murder. Closing arguments are occurring in the penalty phase of that case right now. Let's go there live. Boy, the uh, timing seemed to be perfect there. It looked like the state wrapped up its rebuttal of closing arguments in the penalty phase in the Roy Oliver case in Texas. Jurors have to go back and determine whether or not to give him a minimum of five or a maximum of 99 years for murdering a 15-year-old unarmed African-American victim. Attorney Eric Weitz, a couple of final thoughts uh, in your final moments with us today. Pretty powerful stuff, you know arguments lawyers live to, to make, but you can't make in the other aspects of most trials. Uh, I think the prosecutor did an amazing job of undermining the, the, the arguments that the defense was trying to make to have the jury almost become distracted from their job. Yeah, that, that's what it seemed to be to me. The state asked, asked for a minimum of 60 years in this case, and the state said that this was a powerful public protection argument from an angry, vile defendant. This is in the hands of the jurors. I think we're going to sign off for the day. Attorney Eric Weitz, trial attorney from Philadelphia, I appreciate your insight today, as always. Aaron, thank you for having me. Okay, I think we're going to wrap up the broadcast day here on the Law and Crime Network because this is in the hands of jurors. Keep an eye on our Twitter feed if indeed there is a sentence recommendation tonight. For now, this is Aaron Keller, and for all of us, have a good evening.